blessing to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. I'll go ahead and apologize. I've been dealing with some allergies and stuff, so I'm going to have congestion today, but we're going to do the best. So uh, at this time, I'd like to invite Carolyn forward to open us up in prayer. This time I'd like to invite Hoop forward for the lighting of the candles. This time, if you please stand and join me in singing hymn number 326 in the Green Book, uh, Wonderful Words of Life. May be seated. If you'll turn in the back of the green books uh, to page number 489 or 488, 489, and join me in reading the responsive reading, Confession of Christ, number 553. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, 
God dwelleth in him, and he in God. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. Amen. All right, at this time we'll open it up and we'll sing two congregational choices. So what do we want to sing? Number two. Sing the first and last.
Uh, if you please stay standing as we welcome and greet one another. Now we'll go into announcements and prayer concerns. Announcements for today, um, Monday at 4 p.m., we're going to be having a Bible study. Uh, Saturday, April 20th uh, at 1 p.m., Lisa's Country Kitchen outing. Uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. Uh, Sunday, April 21st, we're going to have a lunch in. Friday, April 26th is movie night at 6 p.m., and last thing is, today is the last day for the ballot, uh, the anonymous ballot we have in the back. So if you haven't filled one out, uh, do so before you leave and then just put it in the box with a little slit on top. And then we're going to do the, uh, all the questions that'll be asked. We'll do all the stuff and we'll come with, I'm trying to think of the word. Basically, we'll come with who said what. Results. Results. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> My brain was not working. This time we'll go into prayer concerns. Glenn, Anna, can you hear me? Yes. Glenn, you have any prayer concerns? No. Okay. And Anna, how about you? Yes, my niece in Georgia. Your niece in Georgia. All righty. Now, any other prayer concerns?
prayers for recovery. Was she vaccinated with it? No. Okay. I was just knowing that my, my, my mother, she had that uh, long COVID too, but she was vaccinated. That's what I was asking. Uh, any other prayer concerns? So praying for the CAT scan to work and show. Uh, any other prayer concerns? Any others? If not, please bow your heads as we pray. God, we thank you for this, this blessing, this, this opportunity to be able to come into your house, to gather together, Lord, as a congregation, as a group of people, here to worship and honor and serve you. And God, we take this time in our service to, to lift up these names, to lift up the congregation, to lift up the people in this world that are suffering, that are struggling, that, that have ailments, Lord, we lift them to you. And Lord, we ask specifically uh, for Anna's niece, Georgia. Uh, we don't know what is going on. We just ask that you help her wherever she needs it, as well as you continue to help those in our congregation that need recovery, such as Michelle, and be with Don and Jill. And Lord, please continue to be with those who are suffering from long COVID, and specifically for Mary Lynn. As she is getting over this COVID, allow her to be able to return to work and allow her to be able to continue to live this life and not be held back because of the ailment she has. And God as well, please also remember Carolyn, uh, Carolyn's daughter Christy, uh, as she's trying to get an MRI and an x-ray, Lord, we just pray that the CT scan, the CAT scan, Lord, we pray that they can find what they need to through that and they can do it to help her. And God, also we lift up Mary as she is going into labor, Lord, another child is coming into this world and Lord, that is a beautiful thing. We just ask that everything goes smooth, everything goes well, allow the baby to be healthy and allow it to come out with a smooth delivery. We thank you for all you've done and all you will do and we lift up this church. We pray that you be with each and every one of us. You know what we need, we know, we know what we are struggling with God and we just ask for your guidance and your wisdom. And as always, Lord, we ask that thy will be done and not ours. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Oh, 
that everything we've been given in this life is a gift from God, correct? At this time, we collect the tithes and offerings to show our thanks to God. Everybody. Today's scripture verse is going to be from John chapter 15, uh, and we'll be reading verses 18 through 25. Uh, now, this actual passage, um, it, it tells Jesus, it's Jesus telling us, uh, Christians, and he's, he's preparing us for life in this world. Now, the title of my sermon today is The World Would Love You. Uh, the title of the scripture that we're reading out of in my Bible says The World's Hatred. So please join me in reading John chapter 15, verses 18 through 25. The world hates you. Remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belonged to it. But you are no longer part of this world. I chose you to come out of this world, so it hates you. Do you remember what I told you? A slave is not greater than the master. Since they persecuted me, naturally they will persecute you. And if they had listened to me, they would listen to you. They will do all of this to you because of me, for they have rejected the one who sent me. They would not be guilty if I had not come and spoken to them. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Anyone who hates me also hates my father. If I hadn't done such miraculous signs among them that no one else could, they would not be guilty. But as it is, 
They have seen everything I did, yet they still hate me and my father. This fulfills what it says in their scriptures. They hated me without cause. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So like I said, this is Jesus' words, and in this he's speaking to his disciples. Um, but as we read it and we understand it, we understand that it basically tells us everything we need to know, right? The world will hate us just as it hated Jesus, right? And when we read that, we go into it, we see that Jesus speaks clearly to us that we are separate from this world. But how easy would it be to conform to the world, right? How easy would it be for us to just live in the world? What do I mean by that? All right, because the world views sin as okay, right? Sin is now in the world being brought up to a point to where if you are a sinful person, you are praised, right? Sin has found its place in the world to where sin is now being praised, and we see the opposite effect that we used to see. And I say that because how easy would it be if we could live how we wanted to, right? Not worry about temptation. If we lived in the world, we could indulge in sin. And guess what? God still loves us. Therefore, he wouldn't send us to hell. Because why would he send us to hell, right? If God truly loves us, if it says in John 3, 16, whosoever believes in God, uh, whosoever believes in the, Father, the Son shall have eternal life, right? If that's what that says in John 3, 16, then why would God, if I believe in Jesus, why would he send me to hell if I believe in his Son, right? It says right there verbatim, that I shall not die, but have everlasting life. So according to that standard, then we can live in the world, correct? Right? The world will accept it. The world will okay our sinful nature. And if we conform to these views, then we would be loved by the world, right? Look at verse 19. It says, the world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it. I'm just going to stop it right there. Because that's, that's good scripture, right? The world would love you if you belong to it, right? We'll stop right there. That's all we need to read. Because if we belong to the world, we're loved by the world, right? Everybody else can pick and choose which scripture they want to use, and they cut scripture out to make a statement that they want to say. And according to this one, if we, cop, if we stop it right there, it says that the world will love us. But that's not how it works, right? We don't get to just cut out scriptures. We don't get to just pick and choose. And in this scripture... We can't throw the rest away, but guess what? It's not how it works, right? So when we read the rest of Scripture, it says this, the, Lord, or the world would love you as its own if you belong to it, but you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of this world, so it hates you. The fact is, as Christians, we are set apart from the world, right? We are called to live by God's word. And that means the whole word, right? That doesn't mean we get to pick and choose. That doesn't mean we get to say, all right, I like this verse because it says this, and I don't like this verse because it makes me think that, oh, I'm, I'm doing bad. It convicts me, right? No, we take the word as its whole, the whole word as truth, which means we do not get to pick and choose which scriptures work for us. And yes, God does love every one of us. I'm not saying that. God loves everyone. He sent his son to die for us. But it also says that God hates sin, amen? So if he hates sin, what does that mean? It means he doesn't condone it, right? No matter what it is. So yes, we are all sinners. Yes, we have all fallen short of the glory of God. And yes, we will continue to sin. And yes, we will continue to fall short of the glory of God. But we must still fight temptation and repent. What I mean by that is, imagine if we lived in a world, right? According to that scripture, if I can pick and choose which scriptures I want to use. If we conform into the world indulge in sin, show up on Sunday, listen to some dude talk for about 20 minutes, and you're saved, right? That's all you got to do. You come to church, you hear somebody talk, you're cleansed, you're good to go for the rest of the week, do what you want. That's not how it works. No. And the sad thing of that is, is some people believe that's how it works. But we know that the scripture says we are called to be separate from the world. And if God does not condone sin, then we are called to fight temptation and repent. Not only are we called to ask God for forgiveness, but remember, repentance comes after. 
If I don't repent, how can I be forgiven? What is repentance? Turning away from. Right? I always use that analogy, the cross before me, the world behind me. If the world is sin, when I'm actively, actively being involved in sin, I have my back turned towards God. Only when I truly repent and turn away from the sin am I back looking forward towards God. And when we understand this, we understand that, yes, we're all sinners, but repentance is what sets us apart from everyone else. Right? And that's how God forgives us. It's through his grace and his mercy that we receive forgiveness only when we repent and turn away from the sin. One of my favorite, one of my favorite passages in the Bible is when Jesus is there and the Pharisees come to him. And when the Pharisees come up, they bring a woman. And when they bring the woman, they say, we just caught this woman committing adultery. Two things there. First off, what sin did she do? Adultery. What is that? Sexual relations outside of marriage, right? All right. What did they do? Caught her in the middle of adultery. So they caught her in the act. Where was the guy? The woman was brought to Jesus, but the guy was not. And I want to point that out just, just for some clarification to the idea of it, right? They said, we have caught this woman in adultery, and yet they bring the woman and only the woman to Jesus. And now as Jesus is sitting there talking to them, what does he say? He forgives the woman, right? He says, who that, I don't remember the King James Version, but basically Jesus says, Whoever is without sin, cast the first stone. That's what he told them. He said, because they're sitting there, they're saying, according to the law of Moses, she should be stoned. Right? She was in the middle of adultery. According to the law, she should be stoned. Are you saying we shouldn't uphold the law? And he's saying, no. Uphold the law, but only him who is without sin can cast the first stone. Who in that room was the person who could cast the first stone? Jesus. Right? He who is without sin cast the first stone. Jesus was the only one in that room that was without sin. So what could he have done? He could have followed the law of Moses. He could have started to stone her. The rest of them would have joined in. That's what he could have done. But what did he choose to do instead? He said, you are forgiven. But he didn't end there. What would he finish with? Sin no more. Sin no more. Amen? Amen? That's repentance. So not only did he forgive her, but then he said, now that you are forgiven, go and repent. Go and sin no more. Turn away from the sin. And I love that passage because... I like when Jesus is having those talks with the Pharisees. Pharisees are trying to trap him in something, right? And yet, when you watch, you've seen The Chosen, right? That, that depicts Jesus in more of a human nature side. What I mean by that is, is like he has some quips, you know? He'll, he'll quip back at them, go back and forth with them, right? And I like that because I think that's what Jesus does. As he's sitting there talking with them, right? He, he's, he's like, what? I've, we've already had this conversation. Right? You're going to continue to try to do this, and yet he's calm, right? He has righteous anger, but in these moments he's calm and collected, and everything he does just makes perfect sense. But when we look at this instance as these men, these men were enraged bringing the woman to Jesus, right? Enraged. And when Jesus forgave her, it then showed the whole point of his mission, right? Jesus came to put an end to to the law of Moses, right? Jesus was not saying, right? He was the only one without sin. He could have cast the stone. But he wasn't saying the law of Moses is wrong, right? The law of Moses was created by God. Therefore, anything created by God is good. So if we understand that the law itself is good, the fault was with the humans following the law. And what Jesus does in that moment, he could have followed through with the law, Kept it in place. But he came to show, he says, look, this is not how it's going to be anymore. The law was follow this or this happens. Jesus came to say, 
you can't follow this, so here's forgiveness. And only through his mercy and his love can we have eternal life. So if God forgives us through his love and his mercy and his grace and calls us to repent, what does that mean? It means we can't make a lifestyle of sin. Amen? What is a lifestyle of sin? I'm not going to get political or anything. I'm just saying, what is a lifestyle of sin? Lifestyle of sin is when you have taken up a part of sin, taken up a part or a temptation, something you've fallen into, and it's just a norm to you now. And we can say, you know, homosexuality is that way because it is a way of accepting a, something we see as a sin and turning it into a lifestyle. Same thing with people who have open marriages, adultery. You're taking a sin, making it a lifestyle, right? And we see this so much more today. You know how many thruples are a thing now? I'd never heard of that. And now people my age are getting involved in thruples. It's where they, three people live together, and they're a couple, all three of them. I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. But I say that because we find more and more the evil things of this world are now becoming a norm that we're just like, what in the world? It doesn't make sense. And that is why I wanted to talk about this today. All right, because when we look in the world and we see these sinful lifestyles being praised, these sinful lifestyles being okayed, right? We have to go back to what we understand because here's the thing. There's younger generations that are going to grow up in this world, amen? So what is our job to the younger generation? To teach, right? You got to think, the more and more this world gets worse, the more and more the younger generation is going to see it as normal. And if the younger generation sees it as normal, it's going to lead them into living that lifestyle. And as Christians, that's why we need to believe what we believe. We need to know what we believe. We need to understand the Word of God. We need to be able to look into it, dive into it, be able to explain it to somebody else. Otherwise, what are we doing? What is our job as Christians? Our job as Christians is to make other disciples for God, right? Spread his word. If you don't know his word, how can you spread his word? Amen? Amen. And what do I mean by know his word? I ask that. I'm not saying, can you quote scripture out of this to me? I can't quote some scripture. You heard me a second ago. I was stumbling over my words. I can't quote every scripture in the Bible. But do I know what the Bible says? Yes. And what I mean by that is, just as when we come to Christ and we are changed and we are made new, right? We feed on the milk of the word. That's what it says we do. The milk of the word, to my understanding, this is my understanding, I believe the milk of the word is the literal words you read. What is the literal story of Jesus? Jesus. Jesus came, Jesus died, Jesus rose. And when you read that, you understand the literal sense of the translation. I believe the meat of the word is then what we get out of the context of the word as a whole. What I mean by that is when we read the New Testament, we see the overlaying relationship with the Old Testament, right? We read about the Passover. We see how Jesus was the lamb, right? We understand that. That's the meat of the word. You don't need to know the meat of the word to be able to know the word, right? And if you know what it says, you know what you believe, you know what the Bible says, you know the story of Jesus, you know the forgiveness, you can spread the word. But why am I saying that? Why am I going on this whole spiel about spreading the word? Last time I talked, I held up the book and I said, what makes the book special? Is there special ink when it gets printed off the press? Is there special papers that were anointed by some priest? No. In reality, this is paper, onion paper, printed off on a press with regular ink. Nothing of this in itself is special. 
But, as I heard a comedian say, and I think I've told you all this, a comedian said, what makes, it, what makes it the Word of God? Right? If, it, if we understand that it is just printed off and that it is just paper with words on it, what makes it the Word of God? He says, well, first off, it's not just a book. It's 66 books written over a long period of time, all connecting with the same message. Does that make it Word of God? No, it just means there's no other book like this. Then he says, in the book, people, historians, uh, geologists, have read the Old Testament, saw that these people were buried there, this city used to be there, went, found these things, actually found these people buried there, actually found these cities there. Does that make it the Word of God? No, it means it's historically accurate. Then he finished with saying, in the book of the prophecies, we read over 250 prophecies that were made over 200 years before Jesus was even born. One of those prophecies saying that Jesus would be crucified years before crucifixion was even invented. And then what happened? 200 years go by, a man named Jesus comes, fulfills every one of those prophecies. Does that make it the word of God? No, but it's starting to get close. That's what he says. And I say that because if we understand that the word itself, this is just paper, right? Only when we pick it up and only when we read it through the lens of the Holy Spirit within us can we truly understand the word of God. And I say that to then go into, you know, we're Christians, right? How many of y'all got some of these at home that got some dust on them? I mean, I'm not looking for a show of hands. I'm just asking. How many of these, we got so many of these that we don't even know where all of them are at? And yet, just as I opened up that prayer, I said, God, I thank you for this opportunity and this blessing to be in your house. We take this for granted. Do we not? We take four walls and a steeple for granted. Because there's some people that don't have this. And to make us feel even worse, if we take the steeple and the four walls for granted, what about when we take this for granted? People overseas just getting caught with this, going to jail for 10 years, and most times when you go for jail for this in those countries, you're not going to get out in those 10 years. You will be killed. Or you'll be buried under the jail to where you're never getting out. People, if they have these in their house, are drug out to the street. And a, and a dad has to watch his son and his kids get killed in front of him for them to him to get killed right after. This is true things that are happening in this world, Right? And yet we got dust on ours. And I, I'm, I'm not pointing out at anybody. I'm, I'm just the same. Right? I struggle with it. There's days where I didn't read my Bible and it's been three days. I'm like, what am I doing? I'm a pastor. I'm supposed to be reading my Bible. Right? I'm, I'm no better is what I'm saying. I'm not doing this as a way of saying, you know, trying to make y'all feel bad. I'm saying this is the same with me. I do the same thing. And how... How bad is that, right? right? We give this this blessing, this opportunity to come and worship the Lord, right? To be able to go into a store and buy these wherever, get them custom made with your name on it. You know what I mean? And yet we still take it for granted. Truth is, is we're called to stay away from sin. We're called to be the light in this darkened world, right? That doesn't mean we're called to live in the world, right? Not be of the world. We're called to be a presence in this world, spreading the word of God to those who are in this darkened world. It means we need to know what we believe. And it means sometimes we got to step back and check ourselves. Am I taking this for granted? Am I messing up? And in that moment, fix it, right? If you feel convicted from what I just said, like I said, it's not from me. 
I'm not trying to convict you. I'm not trying to be mean. I said I'm the same way. But if you feel conviction from what I said, open up your book. Open up the Bible. Blow the dust off. Open it up. Start reading it. Do something at your house to where maybe you try to read the Bible in one year. Or maybe to where you're doing a devotion every day. Anything that gets you into Scripture, and when you get into Scripture, again, don't just open up the book to read. Right? Open up the book to read through the lens of the Spirit. Amen? Only then can God truly speak to us through His Spirit that is within us. Amen? But, going back to sin. The world tries to make it okay. Right? We live in a world to where sin is, is, is propaganda. It's, it's everywhere. And they try to endorse it. Right? Try to make you go out and get drunk. Try to make you go out to party. Right? Nowadays, kids, uh, kids are talking about having babies in like high school now. And I don't understand it. Like, we live in a world that has fallen. And guess what? It's going to keep falling even more. And that's why as Christians, we really need to tie down on what it is we believe. Because only when we turn away from the sin can we truly be forgiven. And I've said this so much, but I can't, uh, it can't be more true. That God and the world are opposites, right? God created the world, and the world has now turned away from God. Turned away from God a long time ago, but we see it more now. And as Christians, we must stand up for God and be a part of a faith and a Christianity that fights against the world. And by doing so, the world will hate us, right? That's what it's told. Have you ever talked to somebody and you just mentioning Jesus or you just mentioning the Bible and they get mad? You ever had that? I was talking to one lady one time and I forget what got it brought up, but she asked me, honestly, I do forget because it, it was very traumatic. Uh, she, she said something and I had mentioned to her about something we were doing at church. And I said, you know, do you know Jesus? And, and she got so mad. I mean, when she was, she was yelling, screaming at me, saying, oh, I, I don't need to know none of that. Jesus ain't really this, that, and the other. Yelling at me, cussing me out. I just said, ma'am, I'm sorry. Have a good day. God bless. Walked away. But I say that because what do the demons do in the Bible? Right? They fear God. They fear Jesus. Even the demons who were fallen angels, right? People who were once with God in heaven, then listened to this one dude named Lucifer and ended up getting thrown out of heaven and forced to live on this world, becoming demons, right? We see even them fearing God. And yet we have people today that will laugh at the face of God. We have people worse than the demons in the Bible. That, that, if that doesn't scare you a little bit, I don't know what will. And the point in my saying that is, there's going to be people that hate us so much that they are going to want... If you say you're a Christian, basically might as well have a neon sign above your head. Because those people that I told you about, like that woman... Those are the same people that will watch your every move. And you know why they're watching you, right? They're going to wait for that one time you slip. Right? If that woman would have cussed me out and I cussed her right back, what would that have done? It wouldn't have done anything. Right? What's the point? Right? I'm acting on my emotion just as she was. And I say that because when we have that sign above our heads, that's why we need to know what it is we believe. Because if you have someone come up to you and they're calling you out on that stuff, you need to be able to preach the word. You need to be able to defend your side. Only when we know what we believe can we truly and fervently spread the word of God. But when we are living in this world that we see that is controlled by, by the things that are of sin... We need to understand that that's where we're supposed to be, right? 
We're supposed to be that light for those people. And again, I may not have done anything to that woman. That woman may have never accepted Christ. But in that moment, if I mentioned it to her, and as she's leaving, as she's had this moment of just freaking out and yelling at me, saying, well, you have a good day, God bless, that may be the only Jesus she gets that day. And who knows? Maybe planting that seed, maybe God later on will water it, and he can be entered into her heart, right? I don't save people. You don't save people. That's not your job. Your job is to share the word of God. Whatever happens outside of that is up to divine intervention. Amen? Amen. Now, I'm wrapping it up, I promise. I feel like I'm losing some people. But I say this, I say, so what? All right, we know this world is going to hell, right? We know this world is getting ten times worse. What does that mean for us? I say it as, so what? What I mean by that is, is what's going to happen to this world? This world is going to be ultimately destroyed. And when that day comes, we will reside with Jesus in the new heaven and a new earth. And that's what we look forward to. So I say again, what do we do if the world hates us? So what? This world is not our home. If a world that is destined for destruction by the God I serve hates me, I don't care. Because guess what? We're all going to meet him one day. You know what I mean? And if that's the case, why would I follow a world that is going to be destined for destruction? What I mean is, I don't know about you, but I will stand for God every day of my life instead of living and supporting a world that is destined for destruction. Now, I want to close with 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. It says this, Therefore, come out of among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Do not touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you. He says it again. Separate yourself from this world. Right? We are called to be in this world, but not a part of it. Because this world is against God. But we must strive to fight for what it is we know to be the truth, which is what we find in this book. Amen? Amen. And this is and always will be the true word of God. As we leave here today, we leave as one group of Christians who serve one God. And we must stay true to what God teaches us through his word. As we go out this door and we go our separate ways, we must always remember that we are called to love everyone as Jesus. But that doesn't mean we should conform to the worldly views. Because as Christians, we are called to be separate from the world's views. What I mean by that, and then I promise you I'm closing out. Don't get too mad. Just now, 1130. We'll go a little over. What I mean when I say that, don't let anyone attack your faith. I've been in many debates, many arguments over what it is I believe. What I mean by that is, is as I'm talking to people that may be living a sinful lifestyle, and as I say, I understand that if you live a sinful lifestyle, I do not believe you should be within seats of power within the church. Meaning, if I'm living a sinful lifestyle, I believe y'all would not want me to be up here. Correct? Right? So, if I'm living a sinful lifestyle, it should be the same everywhere else. Right? If we understand that we are called to do better, called to be better, again, not saying I don't sin, right? I sin just like everyone else. 
Sinful lifestyle is something completely different. Sin is a mistake. Sin is a moment of weakness. Sinful lifestyle is accepting it as a new norm. And when I've been in these debates with these people, they'll quote John 3.16 to me. And that's why I say it's the most misquoted verse in the entire Bible. Because they'll sit there and they'll quote it to me and they say, so I know Jesus is the Son of God, therefore I'm saved. Okay. Even the demons say they believe he was the Son of God. So that brings forth the question, what, is it, what does it mean to believe? And the reason why I say don't let anyone attack your faith is because we are called to love everyone, yes. We are called to love everyone like Jesus, amen? amen. That does not mean you conform yourself to love someone else. Does that make sense? I can love a sinner and still despise their sin. I can love someone and still lead them to repentance, lead them away from. Does that make sense? And a reason why I say that is because we live in a world where everyone is afraid of controversy. Everyone is afraid to call somebody out and lead to some argument breaking out. Not me. I like calling people out. It's fun. Uh, I like the arguments. But I say that because if people are going to try to force you to feel bad for them, trying to say, you're a Christian. Why are you being judgmental? I'm not being judgmental. I'm simply saying, believe this is a sin. Yeah, but you're judging me for what I do. You're going to see that countless times. And that's why I say you need to have your strength in the Word, because according to the Word, we know what's true. Amen? And don't let someone confuse your faith or be a stumbling block in your faith just because they're saying, oh, you're a Christian and you're being hypocritical, right? They'll attack your faith before anything else. So stand strong in what you believe so that we can defend the word of God. Amen? Mm -hmm. All right. Now, I told you I'd close out. So if you'll please stand and join me, we will sing our final hymn. Hymn number 505 in the green book, Footprints of Jesus. We'll go ahead and sing the first and fourth verse. Fourth verse. disciples in this darkened world. That means as we leave here, just as you tell kids, right, when they leave your house, you say you are a representation of me, right? As we leave here, we are a representation of God. Amen? He is our Father. We say we are Christians. We got that neon sign above our heads. All that relates back to God. Amen? Amen. All right, so as we go forward, keep that in mind as we live this world and as we spread the word of God to truly be his disciples and Christians. Amen? Please bow your heads as we pray. 
God, again, I thank you for this, this wonderful blessing to be in your house. Thank you for allowing us to come here today, Lord. God, I thank you for speaking through me. I pray that everyone got something out of today. I know I did. God, I pray that you guide us and lead us as we go for the rest of this week. Allow us to truly be your disciples and allow us to truly live for you. And God, as we leave here today, bless us and lead us as we continue to fight in this world, this darkened world, as we continue to fight to follow you. And now I will give us a benediction, and then we will sing our final song. Lord, bless you and may keep you, pour his countenance upon you. May the Lord lead you and guide you through everything. Amen. Amen.